Hello everyone, I'm all kinds of ready to talk about wireless communications today, so let's get to it. Within the context of the OSI model, we're talking about both the physical layer as well as the data link layer. So not only what are the physical properties of um, communication waves, but also what is the protocol that sits on top of there for communicating uh, in that environment. If we're in, an air, in a room, for example, where you have an access point above us, how is that communicating packets of information? So those, those are the two things that we're going to be talking about. And why should we care? Well, uh, consider the world that we live in. Um, it used to be that we just had PCs that were all connected by cables. Uh, in the modern era, though, we have a rapidly expanding area of smartphones, and then look at the, look at the Internet of Things. It's supposed to provide even more connected devices to the Internet than even smartphones represent now, which now outstrip PCs in terms of their sheer numbers. Uh, and so as part of this, the wireless communication is tremendously important. Okay, so uh, we've talked about the physical layer before as it relates to cabled communications. Uh, historically, most of our communication in this world has happened by cables, and we're getting more and more used to, these days, uh, communicate, communicating wirelessly. Although for many digital natives today, they probably always just assumed that um, wireless was the way to go. And in many ways, they're, they're right now. Uh, some of the drawbacks of wired communication is just it's expensive to run cables between any two given places, and it can also be quite expensive. So, um, All right, so some of the nice benefits of wireless are that uh, it can be really easy to put between two places and set up your whole office network. Uh, it, and when I say two places, I mean an access point and your receiving devices. So if I were setting up an office today, uh, you know, or a dental office or something like that, it sure is a lot easier to just throw in an access point and put some computers out on the floor with some wireless cards in it than it is to you know, put wires throughout um, all of the walls and put in nice little um, connection panels in there. Okay, so as we get started on this, there's a couple things that I think are important to emphasize. And, and one of these is the electromagnetic spe spectrum. Uh, and then we want to talk about some of the key technologies that we use in business or in our homes. Okay, so it's kind of weird to suggest uh, while you're watching a video to watch another video, but uh, I would recommend that you do the following. Go over to um, YouTube and type in Best of Science, the Electromagnetic Spectrum, and watch this five-minute video. Uh, I don't know if it's actually put out by NASA. It's branded that way, but it's a fantastic explanation of what the electromagnetic spectrum is. And uh, after that, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to be waiting for you on the other side here, and I'm going to recap some of the things that are there. So go for it. Okay, so hopefully you watched a fantastic video and you're ready to talk a little bit more about the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. So we have um, energy as well as magnetic ray uh, waves that are uh, simultaneously being uh, communicated all the time at near the speed of light. Uh, and there's uh, lots of that flowing around us all the time. Some of the key differences that, well, so, so here's one thing. One is that, uh, one, some of the key ideas is that these waves are always um, uh, arriving at a similar or a constant rate near the speed of light. But what's different about them and, and how we break them into classes is how far apart the wavelengths are. Uh, and also uh, kind of related to that is, you know, once you push these things closer together, you know, from the width of football fields down to the atomic level, if they're passing a given point, they're hitting it faster and faster. And some of the, so those are kind of some of the big ideas behind this as, as it relates to our use of them. Okay, so here's a diagram which gives us a little bit extra information. And uh, if, I, if I take a vertical slice down this at any point, there's a bunch of related information for anywhere that we're looking at in the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's not just the size of a wavelength, but there's also uh, properties that, that occur because of or, or within that given area. So, for example, on the lower end here where we say, uh, uh, you know, the, where our wavelengths are, you know, 10 to the third in meters, they're approximately the size of soccer fields or buildings. And if I, as I go down a little bit, there's a class that that exists in, which are called radio waves. That's just a name we give to it. Um, uh, we can see what type of source would generate that. We can see how fast that hits a fixed point, and and how fast something hits is in hertz. Uh, 
And so again, going back to this fixed point, how many, how fast is something hitting that fixed point? It could be in hertz, kilohertz, gigahertz, and and that gigahertz name you may have heard of before because if you look at your wireless uh, devices, they typically talk about 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So that's how fast, uh, how many waves are hitting a fixed point per second. Okay, so moving along, uh, well, okay, just to the maybe the bottom here. So not ready to move along yet. Uh, another thing to note here is how much energy is contained in those waves. And uh, it's relatively low waves or low energy, which means it's also not very harmful uh, as they're represented by huge waves. On the far other end of things, we're talking about subatomic sub distances between uh, the waves uh, in, in terms of the wavelength. And uh, over here in that category, we have things like gamma rays and x-rays and uh, they come by ridiculously fast and they also have enough power to kill you. So uh, if I were Scotty, which is the theme of our class, right, uh, and you know all about data communications and moving molecules throughout the universe, uh, you know if I was going to make a hand phaser this is probably what I would be thinking about is uh, how can I put a lot of power into a ray that I'm sending out. Um, there are some other things to know about this though, this spectrum. Uh, there are different properties in terms of how these waves react with the rest of the world depending on where, where they're sitting. Um, over here uh, where they're really short and hit us really fast and therefore dangerous, right, um, they actually attenuate or they don't go as far before breaking apart. They tend to be kind of brittle uh, at this high end. So they're not really as reliable the higher we get for data communications because they can disperse really easy. Um, and then they, they tend to be kind of robust here on the lower end of things in that they can go you know hundreds of miles potentially if you put enough power behind them and they wrap real well around the contours of the earth. Anyway, if you've got a few extra minutes, just look at the size of the wavelength represented as actual things in our physical world to see uh, how big those waves are. Um, maybe I should just emphasize one more thing though. So common names of the, the bands uh, of the speed that we're talking about. So over here we have radio waves and we have microwaves. Uh, so this is where we're talking about a lot of our data communications over here. Uh, and then we get into infrared and it's just this little tiny band right here which is uh, visible. And then we go on to non-visible again on the higher end of things. Okay. All right, now uh, since we have scientists and they understand how these things work, uh, and they can actually generate, in, you know, oftentimes waves within uh, any of these areas of the spectrum. Um, clearly, then we could do lots of fun things in this world, uh, but that would actually cause chaos if we just started broadcasting on across all of these different waves that are available. And so, we we have here, for example, a, a bunch of or just some of the regulatory bodies that exist in the world, such as the Federal Communications Committee Commission or the European Telecommunication Standard Institute to tell us where, where we can and can't use things um, so or, or what bands we're allowed to use. So now that kind of makes things make a little bit more sense when you think about police and um, airlines and stuff like that. They're all talking to each other. Uh, in theory, we can just kind of move up or down the band and be able to hear them on a particular channel, which is oftentimes just a particular slice um, or, or frequency that we're listening in at. Uh, so but they don't want us by regulation to use certain areas so that it you know doesn't harm all of us who need their services. Okay so uh, building on those ideas of our spectrum uh, we have another so here, here's more of our communication bands uh, being highlighted here so uh, we, we see so this, this really represents the whole thing we just saw again, but these uh, gray bars represent uh, some of the key data communication areas. So over here on the far right we have 5 gigahertz, so this is oftentimes what we use with wireless communication um, in our homes and in our offices. Also 2.4 gigahertz, this is also something that we use. And then there's uh, some stuff a little smaller. Or sorry, actually, it's bigger uh, technically in terms of the wavelengths. But you can see that uh, as we get uh, that as we look at television and FM and AM radio, these te technically have bigger or, or more spread apart waves that are used to communicate with us. All right, moving on from that. Uh, now that we have the high level idea of how that works, let's talk about uh, antennas for a minute. Uh, antennas 
they can either be the, the source of uh, communication of a signal, or, so we can generate a wavelength of, of data, electromagnetic communication. We can generate it from an antenna or we can receive it on an antenna. And interestingly enough, we can actually change the shape of the signal that gets sent out. All right, so um, in our midterm, we're going to have to know all of this material right here, and so we're about to dive into that right now. Okay, no, I'm actually actually kidding. Um, we're not in the engineering field. We just uh, take advantage of a lot of the devices that are out there. But just know that this is a relatively deep field, uh, and it, um, in terms of mathematics, and and you can do a lot of creative things with your antennas. Uh, let me just hit some high-level ideas related to them. Uh, let me go into the lower right here, and here's two bent wires. Imagine that you had uh, electricity coming in one uh, wire one direction and then coming out another wire the other direction. If these things were completely parallel, then their fields would cancel each other out. But when you spread them apart like this, I believe this is called a dipole antenna, uh, what happens is the electricity as it go cross goes from right to left, um, it will generate a field. And so that's our um, our electromagnetic communication upon which Wi-Fi and things like that are built. So that's where how we can potentially create our 2.4 and 5 gigahertz wireless G, wireless B, wireless A, wireless AC, wireless N types of communications. Um, we have the ability to create lots of different patterns as uh, you know based on mathematics right uh, we can uh, we can and also just the shape of our antenna we can um, create different signals in different shapes so one is omnidirectional so this is kind of just like any like a, a straight up stick on the back of a lot of devices right just straight up and down it creates a donut pattern but if we don't want to go in 360 degrees and up and down we might ha have more focused um, broadcasts that we need to make and in particular let's look at the Yagi and the parabolic down here uh, these imply that if we need to send things between two places uh, we can send it over a long distance and it can be very focused um, some of the terminology that we get when we're talking about antenna are gain uh, watched a bunch of videos on this just recently to understand it a little better DBI means uh, decibel from isotropic meaning isotropic means there's, there's like this if you had an antenna, an isotropic antenna is theoretically a sphere, and so it broadcasts out perfectly in every direction. Well, when you add in gain, gain means you're starting to focus it in a particular direction that's not in a sphere anymore. Uh, and as you just change from going from a sphere to focused in a direction, uh, you actually get higher decibels or power po focusing in a particular direction, kind of like focusing light going out in one area. Think about a flashlight. You can go in all directions. You could focus it in one place. So the power kind of goes up, or the perceived power, if you focus it in a particular direction. Um, and in terms of regulating this or measuring it, uh, the way the the, the number or the term that we use for that is EIRP, effective isotropic radiated power. So if we put more wattage and power into our antennas as we're broadcasting, then in terms of how they're received in the world, uh, we can say, hey, this is a much more powerful one based on this, uh, this term right here. Um, one thing, so, so decibels are, are actually kind of a generic term across many different things, and so oftentimes you'll see like a DBI or a DBM or a DBD, uh, and it really, so, so it means different things in different contexts. Uh, so DBI meant kind of like uh, the difference from uh, just a spherical broadcast. But the, the one thing I want to talk about, though, as it relates to the, the power, overall power of your broadcast is just attenuation. And we get this with our physical media as well uh, and our wires. And basically the high level idea being that the farther you go, uh, the more signal loss you get or just generally any loss that you get that could happen not just for distance but for other reasons as well as we're in the wireless um, area. So what are some of the things that are going to impact both how far we go and how good our connection is? And by the way, if our connection isn't very good, if our signal's not very good, uh, what'll happen is we just, it just takes more um, uh, error checking and correction to get a signal across, therefore a, a lower overall data communication speed. So um, some of the things that are going to affect the signal, things like how much power we're pumping into our antennas, how good our antennas are, what's the type of radiation pattern that we're using, uh, and also are there obstacles in the way. 
of uh, the thing that being being broadcasted from point A to point B. So related to attenuation, if you were setting up um, an area in which you wanted to receive Wi-Fi, for example, here's here are some numbers related to the attenuation or the reduction in strength of your signal that you're going to get based on common properties. Uh, that are around us. So do you have a drywall wall in front of you or between you and the uh, the source, the access point? Do you have a glass wall with a metal frame, a cinder block wall, a metal door? Uh, as we go through the list looking for low and high, we see, for example, that a window and a plaster wall are about the same in terms of reduction, but it gets worse if we have metal frames on a glass wall. Um, cinder block walls actually better than a glass wall with a metal frame. Uh, the worst thing in this list is a metal door in a brick wall. Uh, I don't know why you would have a metal door in a brick wall in your house unless maybe you're a doomsday prepper and you're waiting out that planning to wait out the zombie apocalypse, I don't know, but uh, your Wi-Fi signal is not going to be as good in there if uh, you're waiting for that. Okay, so here's another thing I think is interesting, this idea of antenna gain. So remember before I mentioned that gain is about shaping uh, the signal that you're getting away from the isotropic uh, ideal, which is a 360 degree one. Uh, I started looking into this idea the other day as I was looking at antenna on the back of some devices in our lab. And uh, I assume that higher gain is better in that turns out it's not necessarily the case. As we go to the low end, uh, gain, again, it's referring to the shape of our broadcast. So uh, we get a nice circular broadcast here, more probably in the shape of a donut on the low end with a 2 dBi uh, antenna. If we go to this antenna up here, 9 dBi, uh, the good thing is it's gonna actually going to go out physically farther from the source, but if you're um, underneath the antenna or above the antenna, you're not going to get re very good reception. So a story that I heard related to this was, imagine that you have a cafe that you have or, or a restaurant with a big courtyard. Well, if you're inside the building, then a 2B DBI antenna would be a good one to use because like a donut shape, everybody within there is going to get really good stuff. Uh, if you're out in the courtyard, you're really far away maybe from the source uh, so you might want a higher gain antenna, but the issue is, yes, it might go out many hundreds of feet into the courtyard, um, but if you are just a little bit above or below this, the broadcast signal, you're not going to be getting any reception. So just kind of, kind of interesting ideas there. Okay, so... Um, 802.11 is a, a standard that we use or talk about a lot as it relates to Wi-Fi. And um, in your readings, you may have seen other pieces of information in addition to this. I'm just going to focus on a, a couple. Um, some of the things that we focus on uh, quite a bit in our different types of Wi-Fi as we talk about like 802.11a, b, c, g, etc. Uh, maybe there's not a c. Um, but anyway, got carried away there. Uh, but some of the things we hear about are uh, what channels it broadcasts on, like 2.4 gigahertz or or 5 gigahertz. Um, so there are there. Are, different areas of that spectrum that you can broadcast on and there's some pros and cons uh, that are now predictable to you or should be based on which one that you're picking. And then there's also another um, term here, DSSS, Direct Sequence Sped sp Spread Spectrum, uh, which is it can be a little bit problematic. And then this other one, newer one, Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing. Oh, that's a mouthful, isn't it? So. Um, hope, hopefully I'll have some opportunity to show you some differences uh, among these or between these in a bit. But, uh, well, let's see. I think I've got something I can pull up real quick. So with the direct sequence sped, spe sped spread spectrum, if we divide up our, our range that's available to us, so, so 2.412 here to 2.472, um, a if you just go up and down, so think of your a radio station, how you can go like, let's just say 102.7, you can go down to 102.6 and up to 102.8, same kind of idea. If you go around a given um, frequency, uh, then we call that area, and within a, a limited span, we can call that a channel. Uh, and the, the key issue is when you're hooking up your access 
but when you when you have access points in the ceiling and devices listening is you don't want your access points to be um, overlapping in their channels. You want there to be a little bit of a gap. So, so oftentimes if you had a, a device that read such things, you would see that maybe one access point on, in the hall is at one, another one's at six, another one's at 11. Um, and then uh, I'm going to go back to where I was before here. Uh, or, so that, that's really about the direct sequence spread spectrum. So you've got channels and all the frequencies are kind of combined around uh, given uh, channels. Uh, this other one, there's there's a lot to this. You can look up a tutorial on it, but one keyword I thought I'd pull out is multiplexing. So here's a, a picture of multiplexing. It's the idea that you have multiple inputs, you combine it into something, and then you demultiplex it later and separate it out. Um, so lots of pieces of different types of information can go in, get combined into a signal and come back out again. Uh, there, there's a lot to this. I, I think this explanation right here is about as good as it gets for this. Um, it's sent over, your data is going to be sent over many subcarrier frequencies and then later combined and received as a single unit. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the 802.11. Um, standards that we have here. So I just pulled up a Wikipedia page and so you'll often hear things like 802.11, B, A, uh, G, N, A, C. Uh, so some of the more common ones today are going to be include A, C. Uh, historically we we're more talking about A, B, and G, and, and N. Um, uh, AC is pretty popular now. So what are some things that you should know if you're looking at a table like this? I'm sure they'll always be coming out with new ones. Uh, the things you should look for is what's the frequency, so what's the area that it's operating in. Uh, so we see there are 2.4 gigahertz and 5 for a lot of these. Uh, and then we, we over here we can see how much data it can theoretically carry. And then um, Lastly, over here we have its approximate range. So, if you refer, if you remember back to our um, electromagnetic spectrum, one of the issues is that as we get into higher, uh, on the lower end, we can travel farther. So, where the wavelengths are biggest, uh, we can we can go over long distances. Uh, and and so, as we go up into higher ranges, where our wavelengths are coming faster, but um, I call it higher. Uh, but they don't go as far and they're more susceptible to attenuation. And so that's kind of, they're, they're trying to deal with some trade-offs uh, as it relates to those things, as they try to get us more and more bandwidth, but oftentimes as we get in, you know, as we go from something like G, which is operating in the um, 2.4 gigahertz range up to AC, which is in the 5 gigahertz range, it's not going to go quite as far, but it can carry more data. So interesting issues we're, we're dealing with there. But there's also other cool innovations there they have. So as, we're, as we compare 2.4 to 5, 2.4 goes farther, 5 is faster, 2.4. Oh, another, one thing that, about 2.4 though also is that uh, uh, another issue that it has, even though it, um, it does go farther and not, and not quite as fast, some, some issues that it has is that there's, it competes with microwaves and Bluetooth and stuff like that in the same range, and so interference can slow it down. So neither one is really perfect. Uh, five gigahertz, it can go faster and farther, but, uh, or sorry, faster, but it goes shorter and is more susceptible to um, interference and being broken up with attenuation. So if you wanted, you could uh, play with this and fill out the rest of this table and uh, check your understanding there. Okay, so moving up from just the, the physical properties that we're dealing with, we can also talk about the comparison with Ethernet. And if you recall with Ethernet, we have something called carrier sense multiple access collision detection. With uh, wireless communications in, in 802.11, we're talking about carrier sense multiple access collision, collision avoidance. It's, it's a similar idea in that we're still trying to send across packets, but it is a little different in that um, the packets have just a little bit more information in them. Um, and uh, another issue is, uh, oh, that rather than where with collision detection on regular ethernet with wires, you're, you're listening for when a crash happens and then you back off. With collision avoidance, you're actually waiting for like a token or an acknowledgement that you're allowed to send. So that's the big difference. So maybe think about 
decorum and proper manners. In some uh, countries, it seems like everybody talks at once in, in government and politics, right? Uh, I'm thinking of Britain. It seems like everybody's yelling at each other there. Uh, whereas I think you're, you're going to take turns in, in America and in, in our government if you have something to say in Congress. So um, I guess we're, we're more polite potentially with our wireless communication with collision avoidance. We just wait for somebody's turn and give them a chance to talk. So here's an almost impossible little diagram to see but it just says, you know, you're, you're putting together your packet that you're going to send, and then you're, you're really just waiting to see, hey, is it clear to send for me? And you just kind of wait, and you back off random amounts of time if it's not your turn to talk yet. So close, uh, close enough to understand. Uh, as it relates to the differences in the frames or the packets of information that we send, technically we would call it a frame at this level, uh, we see that there's this extra frame control on the... Okay, well on the bottom end here we have our, our regular Ethernet on physical wires. On the top here's our wireless, 802.11. So there's a little bit of frame control on there. We'll ignore it. And there's four addresses rather than two. Um, so we, we're still going to have like a to and a from in, in address in there just like with regular Ethernet. But uh, there's some additional information in there that can be used for forwarding uh, frames um, uh, if, if that's needed. Okay, so uh, issues related to radio waves. So they're not perfect. I mean, they're they're great because it's cheap to set up a wireless transmitter and access point. But they there, there are some issues. Um, obviously, we saw th some things about attenuation if you're passing between walls and things like that. Um, just physical things can also get in their way. You can. Um, your, your waves can bounce off and reflect and even if, if in a given room if the, the paths can can bounce off each other and then arrive at the destination source in ways that are kind of out of sync and will cause interference so just so there's a communication that's being meant to be sent but it gets maybe it bounces because it's the same information is being bounced into as being rem uh, emanated out um, broadly, it might bounce off the same information and arrive at different times, and then so you got to have to correct for that. And it might sound to the receiver like, "Hey, is this new information, or is this the same information I already got a millisecond ago, or something like that?" Um, other issues is unlike a cable, uh, wireless is just floating around everywhere. So if you want to listen to it, potentially uh, it can be tapped, and that's more of an issue for your security class, but something to be aware of. Um, as it relates to that, we do do some tasks in our course uh, where we drive around and we um, note how we can use software to identify what are all the open net networks around us and what are the security that they're running on there. Um, and you know, so clearly people can take advantage of that and do bad things to you. Uh, another security issue is that you might have a perfectly locked down environment and uh, maybe some employee does isn't getting the wireless connectivity that they want and so what they'll do is they'll just use that little um, port in the wall for ethernet cables and they'll plug in their own wireless access point but they won't know how to configure it as well as a professional and suddenly it's as if they've it, for the outside world you know they can somebody can just come up next to your building plug in uh, or, you know, or just hack that. You know, maybe it's an open network or poor security, and, and they can they can literally be on your network as if they were a computer sitting in your data center or something like that, and launch all their attacks from there. So that's uh, not a great great thing at all. Um, and and so this isn't a, so so actually that can have multiple um, bad impacts. I want to tell a little story about something that happened at a church once. Uh, I was uh, a volunteer in Oklahoma City. Uh, to help out with a lot of their church buildings and, and deal with some of their issues. And in some parts of the building, they were dropping their wireless connections frequently. And what had happened was uh, some people had plugged in their own wireless access devices in offices in the building. And that was, and they, those were in addition to the ones that were already there that were installed by facilities management. And so uh, here we are looking at some of our channels there. So some of them where some of our access points were on, you know, maybe um, channel one and others were six and others were at 11. But then when they plugged in another access point uh, that was a rogue access point, well, it, it wasn't being managed and it, and it 
turned out that as devices were, were trying to listen, they, they kept on jumping between different access points and it was causing them to drop connectivity on, on a regular basis because it, um, anyway, it just, you weren't able to maintain a connection well when you kept on jumping between access points every, every couple seconds and, and trying to collect your data packets from different ones. Uh, and so that wasn't necessarily a hacking issue, but it did bring down the reliability of the network.